they can send it back through the plant. They'll send it back through the plant and they can put coatings on it to control the burning rate. And they put stabilizers on it so the powder will last a long, long time if you keep it and store it right. If you see, see some uh, rust colored kernels in there, that means it's starting to break down. What is up, everybody? Mark on the mic, Mr. Ryan Muckenhern to my right. That's a new position for you, Ryan. It's not a seat I get often, but Mark, I sure am honored to be here. Well, we had to make room for the person across from us, which is Mr. Chris Hodgden from the Hodgden Powder Company. Now, uh, for the listeners out there, for anybody, if you've ever fired a shot, you did use gunpowder. <laughs> Which is what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about gunpowder. We're going to talk about the, the Hodgden Powder Company, some history, pretty darn storied history uh, from, from what I can tell, Chris. And uh, man, we're just excited to have you. So uh, let's start this thing off with a bang. What's going on? Hello. How are you guys doing today in this cold winter day? We're doing good. I wish I was using some of your powder to go chase coyotes right now. <laughs> It's a good hobby to have for sure. What, uh, Chris, if, if you can, uh, and I was on the website, uh, tootling around a little bit, but, uh, y- you and your family have been in the powder game for quite some time. I mean, it's, it's, it's really, really cool. Can you, uh, can you give us the, uh, you know, uh, I guess your version of that history and how, how your family got started in, in this venture? Sure. Well, I have to, we hats off to my granddad, Bruce Hodgson, uh, back in, uh, 1947, he, uh, he got out of the Navy and, um, right after World War II and he, uh, he bought about 50,000 pounds of government surplus. Uh, he read about it before World War II that they'd thrown a lot of powder away, uh, surplus away in the ocean, uh, after World War I, it's just unbelievable. Uh, the environmental uh, headache, I'm sure that was. But uh, anyway, he bought he he borrowed from his life insurance policy. It was about uh, seventeen hundred dollars, which was a lot of money back then. Um, that was in uh, November of forty six, and um, he um, he uh, took out an ad in American Rifleman, and he ran that in January of forty seven. And he started in the mail order business uh, after he had acquired f- this 50,000 pounds of surplus powder. He stored it in a, a railroad uh, cargo, uh, abandoned cargo uh, trailer. So he bought a little parcel of land and that was his magazine. Uh, no farmers at the time were wanting to uh, lend out their barns to him to put gunpowder in for obvious reasons. So. Uh, so that's how he started, and and uh, he he w- he had a day job. He was a salesman. Um, he sold appliances at that time, and his boss kept cutting him off uh, because he was out selling his boss. Uh, he cutting cut his territory, cut his territory, and Granddad uh, decided to quit his job, and um, and and do this thing full time. So uh, it, it really was a a full family business at the time. They pretty much worked out of their home in their basement. Um, my my grandmother, Amy, she took the phone calls and kept the books and swept the floors. And my, my dad, Bob Hodgton at the time, my uncle JB Hodgton, they were the they were the workaholics. So uh, they got to haul the gunpowder, you know, 100 pound kegs down to the train station every day on their way to school. They dropped off the powder kegs and then went on to school. But but um, uh, really, it wasn't, uh, uh, it had grown over the years, really. It, the surplus powder started to dwindle in the late 50s. And then so in the early 60s, they had to buy newly manufactured powder through some vendors. And so uh, that's what they did. They entered into a uh, an agreement with Olin, uh, which makes uh, they make ball type powders, and so that that H three eighty was our first uh, one of our first um, newly manufactured powders. H four fourteen, 
uh, some of the early ones. So um, it grew from there uh, throughout the 60s. Uh, and it really wasn't until, you know, really the uh, late 80s going into the early 90s that we um, that we started buying um, uh, extruded powders, which are the stick type powders. And those came from um, originally from Scotland, uh, ICI Noble, and then we switched it over to Australia, which is where they're made now. A lot of our hydrogen powders are made in Australia. So um, uh, throughout the, the, the 90s, uh, of course, in 1997, we came out with a revolutionary new product called uh, Vargit. And uh, Vargit uh, was the per first powder of its kind that incorporated the, the um, temperature and sensitivity um, technology. And so uh, that was all new to shooters then. And we had to educate the, the hand loaders and the shooters out there on the benefits of that with your consistent shot to shot performance, right? In hot and cold temperatures from zero uh, to uh, 120 degrees Fahrenheit, it's gonna hold the same, the same across those temperature variations. And at the time it was a very new, um, wonderful uh, technology. And it's of course grown from there where we have the copper fouling, uh, uh, defouling powders, uh, we have powders that uh, uh, are really good on cutting down on flash suppressant. Um, uh, we have powders that uh, are now ball powders that meter very well um, that they're known for. They also have a copper defouling and insensitive to hot and cold temperatures. That is all re relatively new on the ball powder side. It's always been very good on the, on the single base stick powders. So, so anyway, Ogden has is, is led the way through all those different technologies throughout the years. We try to keep up with uh, all the new technologies that we wanna give to shooters. Um, and we, we try to certainly listen to our customers on what they would like to see us do. And uh, we, certainly, we certainly try to honor that uh, with all these new technologies and new and different. And um, with, with uh, you know, now with IMR, uh, with accurate ram shot um, and, our, and Winchester, of course, are our mainstays now, um, very well-known products. So, so through the years, um, you know, we've really tried to, to um, have the best uh, customer support team available. Uh, we offer our data online for free, which not too many uh, of our cohorts in the in the industry do that. Uh, but we do offer it to our our customers. Um, uh, that's just part of uh, our service to all that that we do. Like, and when you're talking about that de data, like, what kind of data is that then? So, so we have rifle, pistol, shot shell data. Um, Online, we have, I don't know, I, the last count, I, I think it was well over 20,000. We're probably well over 30,000 loads now. Um, and so we do have it in, in both uh, um, the old method of CUP and, uh, you know, in the SAMI method um, with the piezos and, and the new way to measure uh, pressures now. Uh, we, we have kept all of our data uh, updated. Throughout the years, so whenever a new uh, a new bullet comes out, a new case comes out, a new cartridge comes out, we're the first ones to get on that and shoot them uh, for data for our customers. Oh wow, very cool! I I probably use the Hodgin Reloading Data Center once a week, like like on a minimum, and it's always interesting to me when I was younger, and and this is kind of before the internet was what it is now. I was always excited at the first of the year whenever uh, uh, a bullet or cartridge company or, or a powder company had released a paper manual because then I could add to my library. And now, not that those aren't awesome, and I still do pick them up, but I'm on that data center all the time. And, you know, we talk about cartridges a lot on the podcast, and inevitably somebody asks, like, hey, you have this cartridge, you know, what did you do for a load? And, you know, they think I'm some sort of mad scientist, and, and the short answer is, no, I go on you know, IMR powders or Hodgin powders reloading data center. And I pick the bullet weight that I'm looking for. I can 
99.99% of the time find the bullet that I'm shooting and find the data filtered by brand and type uh, and bam, it gives me everything I need. And it's the easiest thing to run. And I just love going through it. And, and like you said, you guys are on the ball with that. I mean, Thank a, you. a cartridge is out for what seems like 15 minutes and here's a full pallet of data for it. <laughs> <laughs> and the the data center is it, it's extremely extremely intuitive. I mean, it doesn't get any simpler. You pick rifle, pistol, shotgun. You pick your bullet weight range. You pick the powders that you have in inventory or you're thinking about getting, and bam, there's your minimum, there's your maximum. And I I love every last bit of it. It's so wonderful. So thank you for having that tool because it makes yeah, my life bet. so easy. <laughs> You bet. We we have some really good top professional uh, ballisticians. Yeah. Um, and when we uh, had the accurate ramshot acquisition, we also picked up a beautifully uh, manicure, manicured uh, lab in, in Montana. Yeah. So um, we are uh, uh, we are so proud of that operation there. And, and they do exceptional, exceptional uh, work. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Chris, is there is there a reason? Is it a is it um, connected to like you know natural resource availability that um, a lot of the production takes place in Australia? Like, is there a specific reason for that region or why that works well? Well, there's there's um, there's no real extruded powder manufacturer in the United States proper. Um, uh, we, we do have a, uh, the world's largest is in St. Mark's, Florida. It's a ball powder plant. Uh, ball powders, you know, they can make extruded powders, but it's really not their specialty. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there's uh, uh, there's one in, in Virginia that makes flake pipe powders for like shot shell and pistol mm -hmm. uh, type powders. Um, and then there's one in, in um uh, most of our IMR powders come from Canada, but it, it happens to be owned by an American company. Um, so uh, uh, that's in Valley, Valley Field, Montreal. Uh, and that's where IMR powders are made. So, um, so there is, there is a, you know, very limited numbers of, of gunpowder plants in the United States now. It's, um, it is what it is. <clears throat> And also uh, the nitrocellulose that is made, um, there's only one place in the United States, and that's also in in Radford, Virginia, where those uh, those flake powders are made. Um, uh, St. Mark's does not make their own nitrocellulose. Also, the one in in uh, Valleyfield does not make nitrocellulose. So it's just a just a really interesting. Um, um, logistic wise how we get gunpowder you know that australians do an exceptional job they are so good with technology They're on the leading edge of technology especially for single base powders um and so um and they are more than happy to do business with us and um uh, they they are very easy to do with they're, they're one of our greatest allies right so mm -hmm. and, I, and i imagine it's it's much easier to turn the key on infrastructure that already exists and is well established in production and that kind of thing, then try to right. start fresh. Right. So yeah, for sure. Yeah, we, we bring those powders in, you know, and we package them. We, we um, also send them through the lab and make sure that they're, they're all correct pressure wise. And so, so we do some quality testing along with everything that we, that we bring in. So what are, what are the fundamental differences between like a, like an extruded stick powder and a ball powder? And then maybe even if we, you know, you, you brought up pistol powders and shotgun powders. Can we go through kind of the differences of each one of those? Yeah, sure. Um, so, so on stick powders, it's, um, it's, a, it's made into a paste. It's like a, um, like a Play-Doh. Mm -hmm. paste and what they do is is it's a chemical compound and they put it in a large press and so and when they put it in a press they've got a, uh, a large metal wheel that's on the end of the press and so it's got hundreds of small um, um, knives on the end of the wheel so as the press is pushing the powder through just like a play-doh you know when we we're kids you know, we pushed it, pushed it through the press, you know, and so this wheel is turning rapidly. 
And as the wheel's turning, it cuts off little pieces of, it looks like pencil lead, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's what they call an extrusion. Okay. And so, and so they can, they can send it back through the plant. They'll send it back through the plant and they can put coatings on it to control the burning rate and they put stabilizers on it. So the powder will last um, a long, long time if you keep it and store it right. Um, with ball type powders, it's more of a chemical compound that is made, uh, that's sent through water and um, they roll the, the chemical compounds through a series of pipes and then it and then it comes out and they also can control the burning speed by the size of the ball or uh, the coating that they put on the powder. So, of course, you know, ball powders, as we know, or spherical powders, as we know, are going to meter easier than a stick powder. Um, traditionally, um, that's why we came out with, as you have on the table there, H43, H4831 SC, uh, 8208 and 4350, all three of those powders are shortened extruded powders. So um, like at the difference between our IMR, some of our IMR powders and the Hodgden extruded powders is that they're shorter, they're shorter extruded sticks that, that, that are in the Hodgden side over the IMR side. I mean, you know, it's different preferences Reloaders have different preferences, of course. So, so um, those those Hodgden powders typically are all shorter grained, and then we have a H forty eight thirty one standard, and it has the larger grain. Some reloaders, hand loaders, like that. So, it's it's for different strokes, I guess. It's it's amazing to me. I've been, I would say. I'm going to go, I'm going to elevate myself slightly above hobbyist. I mean, I'm not a professional or anything like that, but it, it, I'm above hobbyist and well into enthusiast from a reloader's perspective. Like I enjoy doing it because of a, a number of different reasons, but um, how different people are about that. Like I'll have conversations fairly regularly daily with folks that are definitely in one camp. Like, nope, I only shoot IMR 4350, whereas I am an H4350 shooter. And it seems like to me, maybe I'm going to use the word old school, not trying to pin anybody's age on the donkey here, but the older generations of shooters that I talk to, a lot of those guys know, I love that, that classic IMR 4350. Yeah. And that's yeah. one of the first powders that I ever loaded. Um, whereas I'm, I'm pretty bonkers on H4350 for a number of different reasons. Um, you know, extrude the shorter extrusion and the metering being a big one. You know, I really like how that stuff flows. It, it, it's not quite a ball, but it's as close as I can get and still get the performance that I love out of it. Um, and uh, it is funny how, you know, recipe and I'm going to say brand preference, kind of all the same thing, but how brand preferences are so deep in the reloading community and how folks kind of find what their groove is with a powder and they, they love to stick with it. And, and uh, I've, I've done the same thing myself. I'm trying to get down to like five powders because as you can imagine, if you've been doing it for more than five or so years, you open up your powder cabinet and I've got a whole bunch of cans that are three quarters full and, you know, I didn't find a load <laughs> I liked or whatever. And, and I, I told myself, you know, this is just not the way to do it. The way to do it is to, is to pick a core unit of powders that are going to cover everything that I need them to do from whatever cartridges or calibers that I'm going to shoot them in and just utilize them. I'll make a concession here or there. Maybe you don't come up with the most velocity or whatever, but I'm targeting temperature state stability or I'm, I'm targeting economy. Like in pistols, for instance, I shoot exclusively tight group um, just because I, I have to use just a, a sprinkle of it and I get everything I need out of it, whether it's, you know, 938 Special, 40 Smith & Wesson, 10 Auto, 45 ACP, whatever. I can I can get everything that I want out of it and and really shore up my, my I guess, powder variety and and get kind of laser focused with it so i don't have to continually buy storage compartments that i fill with. Well, that's a smart way to do it yeah well you make a product that's uh sound enough that i can and and which is something i really love i look at the palette of cartridges that i reload and i can really i can fit them into like five different powders and that's from centerfire pistol to large bore centerfire rifle on it which is man is that fantastic you know, I 4831 shortcut. I keep grabbing the wrong can. 
I mean, that's a do everything powder. Forty three fifty is a do everything powder. I've I've loaded Varget and everything from two hundred four Ruger to three seventy five H and H. H and H, yeah. And and it's yeah. like how right. how do you pick something better? Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, everybody has their favorite loads, and you know they they. Uh, they 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 have 16 different favorite loads yeah. <laughs> yeah 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 well i imagine you know and it's like <clears throat> there's more than one way to skin the cat sure. right sure and uh i would also imagine it's like you talk about maybe folks are like oh man i only use this but you find something that works mm-hmm. it likely took a little bit of doing to get there yep and then it's tough to deviate from something that's working yeah absolutely and, you know, a couple of years ago, we can remember that interesting phenomenon that as an industry put us all into a, a position. And uh, for me, it was one, it was refreshing. Uh, you folks had the customer front and center during that whole time when component availability was next to nil. Um, there was there was a, a, a certain guarantee that if I was going to find a powder, it was going to have your name on it, which I really appreciated. But having the the swath of versatility in in that product line and me knowing that okay if i'm a 308 winchester shooter as well as not six shooter as well as a 45 70 shooter as well as a 300 win mag shooter if i had varget i could hunt i could shoot mm-hmm. period sure. and and i wasn't really gonna tuck tail and lose anything like i it was i was assured that i was gonna have great performing ammunition Regardless of what availability was, same same thing with H forty three fifty and forty eight thirty one shortcut and all the other stuff that I love. So that that uh, it certainly helps to have a versatile powder in in a can. It's not just the five that are on there that you can load with. It's many many more things. So yeah, we would uh, uh, have an occasional call during the surge, and people would call us up and they'd say, um, "I bought this powder, but I don't know." What, how to use it. Sure. I, <laughs> sure. I don't know which cartridge this goes in, but I bought this powder. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's what that's what the novelty of that uh, data center is. You click that powder, it'll show you where it works. Yeah, so, that's right. true. Yeah. That's true. Chris, you know, we're, we're looking and looking at and talking about these things, and like I've got the H4350 in my hand right here. Um, are those number designations, do they denote something, or is that just the name of the powder? Yeah, a lot of those numbers really go back to, um, a lot of them are from the IMR days. Um, So IMR stands for Improved Military Rifle. Um, And that that was back to to the 1920s or before really when smokeless powder first came out. And a lot of the, a lot of the numbers for powders came from military designations. Um, and then uh, it really, IMR really was the first um, brand that that started selling to the consumer. And um, back in the 20s and the 30s, of course, it was um, very expensive uh, on, on after World War II. And that was the one of the biggest reasons why my granddad got into the business, because um, newly manufactured powder at the time was very expensive. And uh, surplus powders was definitely a very, very cheap. And my, my granddad did a really good job um, along with uh, uh, Vernon Spear and Joyce Hornady and um, uh, Bob Nosler um, just, just uh, went around the country promoting um, reloading. Um, Fred Huntington from RCBS. Um, those are just some of the some of the famous names. They they went all around the country. They had these big extravagant uh, events where they set up these big circus tents and they invited in food vendors and you know they really made it into an event. Mm-hmm. And so and they showed people how to reload. And so what a wonderful way to to uh, inform the public and make it fun at the same time and. Um, and so that's really how hand loading got got to be as popular as it is today. What well, at that time was there was there an elevated practical need to be able to to do that yourself? You know, like let's like um I'll try and draw some sort of parallel here, but you know, any town that I live in, there's a mechanic. 
Like, I don't know how to work on my truck, but I can take it to a guy and work on my truck. Heck, Ryan, I'm not a reloader. I don't know if you know this. I mean, we've done some a little bit, a little bit. We're going to do some more. Um, but uh, but I can also, I, I also have, in general, access to ammo. Sure. I can run to the, you know, whatever my local retailer is and, and, and generally find something, you know. Um, was the need for reloading heightened at that time because you didn't have that access and availability? And if you wanted some ammo, like that was a good skill to have. And if you had the materials, you could do it. I think it really was back then because, um, uh, of course the economy, you know, um, was struggling and people were really struggling at that time after world war two and didn't have a lot of money, obviously. Um, so, uh, Yes, for for those who were interested in hunting and shooting in general, mm-hmm. um, they were looking for um, uh, a way to uh, to expand their hobby, you know, and and so um, factory ammunition and uh, like I said before, um, newly manufactured powder were very expensive, and um, loading surplus ammo and there was a lot of surplus brass out there surplus primers surplus bullets um although you know uh uh, vernon spear and joyce hornady were in the business together at the time it was a vernon uh or is the spear hornady bullet company at one time so (laughs) so um so anyway uh, um it was it was a the hobby the hobbyist the, the the pure shooter uh, the pure reloader was looking for an alternative to the really expensive products at the time. And so that's why that's a big reason why hand loading became a lot more uh, important um, and, and a lot more accepted. Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, I did. I did want to take a step back to my earlier question Um about just some of the fundamental differences of the of the different powder types of shotgun, pistol, rifle. Uh, you hear horror stories, you know, sometimes of uh, you know a person they load pistol powder in their rifle cartridge, and it doesn't go well. Um, so, like, what what is going on there? Like, why? What are the differences, and and why are those? Why do those differences exist and why is it like optimal for a pistol powder to, to, you know, have X, Y, Z properties and a rifle powder to have, you know, other properties? Well, it depends, of course, on the cartridge and the case size, right? And so uh, typically for a smaller case, um, and you're going to want to burn, uh, you're going to want to have a powder that's going to be a faster burning powder because um, it's going to build up, it's gonna have a, a faster a faster peak time pressure wise uh, from, from start to finish. And so um, uh, typically in rifle cases, you have a bigger case uh, and especially in the Magnum type cases, you're gonna, you typically load a much slower powder. And this, so that pressure curve starts lower and builds. And so that's the difference, you know, is depends on the, the bullet weight of the projectile and your primer too, makes a big difference on your pressures. And so, um, so like with a, with a pistol powder, you're going to want to load um, a very fast burning, say tight group. We talked about before um, it's a very fast burning powder in that it loads a, a, almost every pistol cartridge known. Um, you can load it. We have load data for every pistol cartridge known. Um, and then and then something like um, if you switch to a rifle cartridge um, and you just wanted to run a couple powders, uh, something like a, a H4895, IMR4895 is a very versatile powder. Uh, and Varget, too, will load almost anything. Um, but if you, you know, it just depends on the specialty that you're going after. So if you're wanting to shoot a uh, thousand yards uh, with your 6.5 uh, PRC uh, or 6.5 Premore, whatever, you're going to want to have a, um, uh, a medium to slow burning powder. So you can have that slow pressure curve. And so you can get that projectile as far down range as possible. 
And, you know, with, with our temperature stable powders, you want that too. You want that consistency, shot to shot consistency. So it just depends on the, on the case size, on the bullet weight and the primer that you're using. Gotcha. Yeah. It's all really fascinating. Oh, it is. What? Physics is interesting, isn't it? Yeah. It, it is. <laughs> it is. If it was not for metallic cartridge reloading, I, I don't think I would have passed any science class in high school because I'd had, I would have had, honest to goodness, I'd had no, or, or anything that had anything to do with, um, you know, measurements, uh, mechanical aptitude or otherwise, like it was metallic cartridge reloading that, that made me fascinated with measurements, weights, and volumes, uh, and then the chemistry behind it, you know, and, uh, it is, it is, it's captivating. I still shoot factory ammo, but gosh, do I like rolling my own. It's, it's just a hoop. Yeah, it's, it's, it's that satisfaction of, of seeing it perform right before your eyes, yeah. you know, it's just, it's just really good to see, see how, how the work that you put into it yeah. and the satisfaction of seeing it hit the center of the target, you know? Yeah. yeah. There really is that high level of satisfaction. You know, I always say like, you know, like I find a similar thing with muzzle loading or like the limited reloading that we've done. It's like, it's kind of like tying your own flies. You're like, huh. I put that together. Yep. It went bang. It worked. It hit the target. There's just a there's just a high level of satisfaction. Maybe a level of self reliance there. Sure. You know, um, yeah, it's pretty cool. Speaking of uh, you know science and chemistry, Chris, like uh, you know one of these extruded powders. I, I found it super. I can't remember what I was reading a while back, but it was it was on black powder mm -hmm. and like kind of like the the base components of black powder, and I was like. Although I guess the recipe may not be simple and has been fine tuned for a long time, like the uh, I guess the recipe by that I'm saying like the uh, percentages of each sure. material. Yeah, yeah. But like, what what makes up in general one of these powders? Are or are there um, differences are we, between them? Are we talking about black powder or smokeless? Let's talk about smokeless powder. Or maybe okay. should we talk about black powder first? Well, there should be a distinction. There is a difference between. Yes. Yeah, there's a difference. Yeah. 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 Well, well, black powder is really so inefficient, you know, and it and it is just interesting that you know it goes back to, really back to the year of 1000 A.D., where the Chinese used it as a, an elixir, you know, for health elixir, and so, um, and it was and it was really brought over from the Arabs from China to Europe in the 1200s um, and they, and they uh, used it, you know, um, in match locks and they used it in wheel locks and um, handheld cannons uh, going back to like uh, the 1400s. And it's really interesting. And so, and black powder is uh, basically, it's a uh, sulfur, it's potassium and nitrate and charcoal. And it's just a, it's just the percentage of those and how they made that. And you know, we any any chemist, any any person could go buy those materials and make it in your in your bathtub, but it's going to be unstable, and and you shouldn't do that at home. Sure. Right. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, we should be clear about yeah. that. It's yes, a little, yes. little different than moonshine, kind of. Uh, yes. 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 Well, so uh, it, it's interesting. Well, it's interesting how black powder really evolved into when the next best thing is, is smokeless and in that, um, you know, during the civil war and, um, um, uh, right afterwards, um, you know, the, the, whenever the, the person firing the gun at another, if it's in a war, of course, uh, person's firing gun at another person firing a gun, you can see the plume of smoke. Right. And so, uh, the outlaws of the day in the Wild West, you know, they could see whenever you could always tell when someone would fire a black powder gun, the smoke could give them away. Right. Mm -hmm. And so they came up with a with a new invention and they nitrated. It's basically uh, uh, nitrocellulose. It's a, it's a it's a combining a nitric a nitric acid with cellulose, which is which is, you know, like nature. <laughs> And, and 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 what they did was, you know, it's in plant cells, and so um, they uh, uh, they developed um, this nitric acid, and and they put it in gun gun cotton, what they call gun cotton, 
And, and, and back then that was like in, in the 18, actually like 1840s, as early as that is when they started perfecting it. Um, and then in the 1860s, uh, they, were, they were using it in very limited um, uh, time, uh, but, but really it wasn't until like 1888, Alfred Noble, you know, that he, he has the Nobel Peace Prize, he started that. He also invented dynamite. He was also one of the, the original inventors of uh, nitrating, putting nitrocellulose into powder and, and figuring that out. So um, it is really interesting in the late 1880s, that's when some of the militaries across the world took notice. And so um, it was really uh, unstable back then. They didn't really know how to, how to uh, uh, prevent it from blowing up all the time. And so um, they finally figured that out in the, in the early 1890s. And uh, DuPont Company uh, was really one of the first that did that. So, of course, DuPont owned IMR at the time. And, um, and they developed uh, a lot of those uh, smokeless powders in the, in the 18, uh, well, actually the early 1900s. Sure. Wow. That's very cool. Very cool. And so it's that, that's what kind of changes it from black powder to smokeless powder then? Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, they, they basically smokeless powder replaced black powder yeah. in, in the early 1900s. Okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. Very cool. Well, I know I certainly enjoy it today. Yes. I still shoot black, but I, I much prefer smokeless. Yes. It's way, way <laughs> less futzing around. Black powder is uh, it's yeah. romantic. Yeah, sometimes well, you got Pyrodex. And that's you got true. Seven. That's true. There are there are viable yeah. black powder substitutions. Yeah, yeah. But it is more of a romance thing than it is anything <laughs> else. It's just a. Yeah, I've got a fifty-four caliber patch and ball gun that I like to. There you go. Fancy myself. Um, it's like a it's a Hawken pattern, like as close as Sam <laughs> and Jake could have made it in eighteen sixty-five. <clears throat> um, and it's just, I, I just tell myself it's for show, but, uh, it's, it's fun to monkey with, uh, but an absolute pain in the butt. And I can imagine at the time, you know, when, when they were crawling out of the black powder era and starting to look at gun cotton and thinking like, wow, have we, have we evolved? And then, you know, in the 1890s when smokeless came, like what a force multiplier. Now your gun isn't in a state of failure after four rounds, we can, we can just reload it and shoot it again. Um, and you know, the longevity of the arm, the, the stability of the ammunition over time. Um, what, what an incredible and quantum leap in technology that we as a species had made at that point in time that has remained largely unchanged. And that's, that's actually a, yeah. a point of fascination I have. You know, I, I think to myself, I see all these cartridges come out and, um, you know, the next best thing, so to speak. And smokeless powder, for, for the most part, I mean, you guys have done a, a bang-up job of, of giving every technological advantage to the shooter possible. But this is going to be really hard to replace, you know, from, from what it is. And, yeah, you'll get interesting things like the CFE powder line and the, the um, you know, copper solvent component to it. And the, the hydrogen extreme line is predominantly what I load for the temp stability. But as you'd mentioned, like Stable and, and now the Stable mm -hmm. derivatives that are out mm -hmm. there, we're taking an existing technology and simply improving it, but its core functionality is much the same. Um, I mean, w w what could, that we haven't tried already, what could the future of propellant be? And I don't know. I can't, I can't look yeah. at it. And to me, it's like, well, I guess we just get lasers and that's no fun. But, <laughs> you know. <laughs> It, we've tried that with caseless ammunition back in, well, heck, the 70s, you know, caseless yeah. ammo. And that didn't go well. Um, no. And we're, we're back to that metallic cartridge and a loose powder inside. And it still works. It still works to this day. And I, I think, gosh, it's, it's going to have to be something pretty out there. We're going to have to have a, a crash landing in the desert and uh, pull some sort of technology off a craft that's not ours to, to get to the next point in that evolution uh it is amazing how long s loose powder has stood the test of time it has and, yeah. and like you said you know chris and hodgson they definitely uh 
have sharpened the spear over mm-hmm. time, but the spear has remained largely yep. unchanged yep. In, in a lot of ways. It's yep. just, it's really, um, it's, uh, it's really amazing. Yeah, it, it is. Uh, what, uh, we talked a little bit earlier, Chris, you're talking about, you know, storing powder. What are, what are some best practices, you know, person invests in powder and they're a reloader. Like what are the, what are the best practices for storing powder? So it's going to, it's not a good idea to keep, keep uh, your powder out in the garage where it's susceptible to uh, the temperature change, the wide changes. If you live in a colder climate, obviously, but, but um, it, the, the best thing you can do is store it in a dark, cool atmosphere um, that that's where powder uh, thrives and it and it can it, it it really when you when you store it in a uh, uh, place where the the temperatures vary greatly um, typically uh, the stabilizer on stabilizers on the powder they start to break down faster um, and so uh, the powder will typically last a lifetime if you take care of it uh, but if you don't, um, it, it does shorten its life. Um, typically, when you uh, if you've stored powder, you don't know how long you've stored it for, and it's been you know locked away for a long, long time. It's it's always a good idea to just take it out occasionally and open the lid. And when you open the lid, and if it's uh, if this strong ether smell hits your nose, that might be an indicator. Uh, also, another another tip is is if you see see some uh, rust colored particles coming out uh, or you dump out a little bit in your hand or on a piece of paper and you see some rust color kernels in there, that means it's starting to break down. And the third variety, which is very, very rare, is, is actually it's warm to the touch. And that that means it's it is uh, it, it is hurrying along and it's decomposing. And so. Uh, that's very rare, though. That's almost never hear of that happening. Um, you might find some powders from World War II that are starting to do that. Sure. Okay. <laughs> sure. Eighty years later, um, but it, you know, if if that happens, it's always good. You can you can if it if it is it is doing those things. Um, it's always good to to dispose of it properly. Um, you know, you could go out to your garden and sprinkle just a little bit of it uh, in around in your garden. It makes good fertilizer because it has nitrocellulose in it, you know, which is a, which is a uh, fertilizer. So um, so that might be something that you could do to get rid of it. Um, of course, uh, uh, in your, your county probably will have a hazardous handling unit uh, where you could drop it off to. I'll just fertilize the garden. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you, you think about versatility. Are you tired of your tomatoes not <laughs> right. coming to fruit? Okay. <laughs> That's right. it. I mean, That's it. hey. Do you want to accurately send projectiles to a thousand yards and have really good produce? <laughs> really good produce. <laughs> <laughs> Look to the Hodgson Powder Company. Yeah. Chris, maybe we could are we we could hire us as our as your new uh marketing team. I think we I think we're really on to something here, right? <laughs> that's right, that's right. It'll be a real flash in the pan. <laughs> See what I did there? That was, that was a powder. Yeah. A little powder humor. Yeah. I like it. Yeah. Um golly, it really is just a fascinating material. You know, you're talking about powder breaking down over time, Chris. What about I mean, I've had ammunition that I bought who know you know when i was like 12 13 heck my dad probably bought it for me right you know when you load a projectile it seems like it lasts forever is i mean or or is that breaking down over time too if you haven't stored your ammunition properly mm-hmm. yeah so well um eventually <clears throat> yeah i've seen some um some world war ii ammo um that uh, it's it's it starts to come up green around the the base of the primer and around maybe the case of the neck Okay. Uh, you know, some sometimes that that the powder inside will start to deteriorate. It just it just depends. But that's again, it's very very rare. But if you take you want to take care of your ammunition just as just as well as you'd want to take care of regular powder. Yeah, it it is an interesting thing when you think about um, like bulk loaded ammunition, mm-hmm. right? So we're we're talking 
you know, when this stuff is done, like I've got some friends at, at the Olin Corp and talk to them about load schedules on, say, the 5.56 by 45 millimeter line. And the number of rounds that can be produced in a 24-hour period is staggering. And mm-hmm. it's a contained unit that the, the process is, is actually quite clean and, and very, very um, pedicured and, and maintained. Once it's contained inside of that case, it's, it's actually a remarkable vehicle and vessel that it can, can stay long-term as designed. Mm-hmm. And because of the inherent stability to smokeless powders, modern smokeless powders, you know, storage is not necessarily indefinite. Nothing's really indefinite, but long-term storage. Mm-hmm. And, and we see this on the surplus ammunition market where you can, you can crack open a case of M80 ball that was loaded in 1968, you know, and the stuff mm-hmm. is still a very sure. viable, functional, accurate ammunition. Um, mm-hmm. to this day. And, and I think from the hand loader's perspective, I, I too have ammunition that's, I loaded a long time ago, you know, cartridges that I don't shoot a lot of, uh, but still shoot. And I think about the process that I employed while doing the loading, you know, I'm very meticulous about my case cleanliness, you know, that's something I'm a stickler on. I'm not trying to cross contaminate with anything. I don't, I don't eat a hot dog or a slice of pizza, grab my projectile, throw it on the press and go to town. Um, it's a it's a pretty I'm not going to use the word sterile because that's not necessarily the case but a, a pretty sterilized environment inside of the cartridge case itself and then everything's buttoned up um, and and sealed environmentally as good as I can do it without you know putting lacquer on it or anything like that but um, that stuff is is still viable to this day I'll take I'll take guns out that I loaded ammunition for 10 15 years ago and shoot it and it's like oh yeah I remember that being a good load still is right cool. Right. Yeah. It's not like batteries where they just kind of end up dead in your drawer after a period of time. So <laughs> true. Yeah. Very true. Yeah. Um, we talked to just a, a couple minutes ago, we were talking about black powder and and then Chris, you know, you mentioned uh, Pyrodex and triple seven. And uh, I guess I've never shot black powder, but when I started muzzle loading, I started off of Pyrodex pellets and then I went to loose triple seven and then I found black horn two Oh nine and uh, just that was life changing. That that changed my muzzle loading life, Chris. What what is what's going on with that powder? I mean, that is a special special powder. Yes, it's got some um, some uh, properties of uh, nitro cellulose in it uh-huh. uh, for the cleanliness. Um, uh, it, it it is <clears throat> it is a it is a double double based uh, extruded type powder um, um, it, it's, it's what they call more of a bulk smokeless powder um, and so that's where you get the cleanliness and you get the velocity mm-hmm. uh, with the, with a with the lower pressures that you need for a muzzle loader um, uh, some muzzle loaders uh, you know you, you you've got to make sure that your muzzle loader is is <clears throat> a capable of handling the pressures and you want to make sure that you check your data for the muzzleloader brand that you're using. And, um, uh, but, but most of them, um, uh, most modern muzzleloaders today can use, uh, can use Blackhorn 209. It's definitely uh, the most popular, um, muzzleloading powder that we have. And, and, uh, it's, it's just remarkable how popular it is. Um, I just, I prefer the pellets just simply because it's the ease of use of them sure. mm-hmm. um, and the consistency. I, it's for me, it's just dropping in two, three uh, pellets in there is, is always, always easy. And you seat your Sabo on top of that and put your 209 primer on and you're off and running. And it's, uh, it's, it's, it's really changed the market. And, you know, it's interesting when, when uh, the Pyrodex pellets came out in 1997, um, my uncle thought we'd sell maybe a million. And my dad said, no, 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 you're wrong. <laughs> he said, no, we're going to sell 6 million. And at the end of 1997, we had sold 20 million. No kidding. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no kidding. And then you up the yes, ante and then you up the ante again with triple seven pellets too. Yes. I mean, I remember yeah. when, when triple seven kind of came on scene and and what a revolutionary product that was um to come out and and uh you know there was at that time i was much younger 
And uh, there was kind of the same thing going on with smokeless powder where there's somebody's got a brand preference and there's other guys that are saying, no, if it's not Pirate X and, you know, this, this triple (laughs) seven, another flash in the pan. And now, you know, triple seven is, of course, wildly popular still to this day and Blackhorn being super popular. That's another thing, too, though, I got to say, like, you have an offering for every shooter at kind of any level with smokeless propellant, but you, you, you haven't left the muzzle loading enthusiast at any level, whether it's a, you know, somebody who likes to shoot replica cowboy guns or high end, high performance muzzle loaders. There's an offering every step and every tier of the way. Um, and n- no technology is lost. Like as somebody who shoots straight black, uh, out of that 54 caliber patch and ball gun, like, it's a scramble. I have to I have to hawk over multiple powder houses in the US hoping somebody gets a shipment of my very specific powder that I run. Um, and that's my own fault, right? But you know, if I was if I was a cowboy action shooter or if I was a, a BPR BPCR shooter, um, I'd have a lot of different options, you know, that, that I would have available to me that were functional and affordable and obtainable, which is of course the biggest thing. And I really do appreciate that because it, it is to your point, the convenience of the pellet, that's a technology that's never going to go away. Right. I, I see other folks coming out with opportunities like it, I guess. Um, you like dropping two down there. I like metering and weighing black horn. I've metered and weighed triple seven for a number of years as well. And, and, uh, what a, what a cool way to meet anybody at anybody's comfort level or convenience level, uh, in that market space too. And that's one that, I don't know. I see every year we get more and more inquiries about muzzle loading Mm -hmm. than, and I kind of thought I'd have lost money on that bet. I thought that was going to kind of go the way of the dodo bird and, People are going to just stick with cartridge rifles, but I see this interesting revitalization in, in muzzle loading, whether it's for just personal pleasure or a state regulation that dictates that they don't hunt with a cartridge gun that season. Um, so it seems like that's a, a, a not going away industry either, which is cool. That's, that's yeah. super Does uh, Vortex make uh, muzzle loading scopes? So it's typically it, for muzzle loaders. It's an interesting thing. Um, in, I'm going to give you two answers. I'll say yes and no um, in that. Yes, we have an optic um, that is designed for muzzle loaders from a, like a, a regulatory standpoint. Um, and then no, in that any optic could be utilized successfully on a muzzle loader. So Mark and I both shoot modern inlines. Um, I shoot a smokeless gun as well. And I have conventional rifle scopes, if you will, mounted to top them. Um, and, and nothing, nothing about a, an inline muzzle loader or even a smokeless gun, if we're going to put that in its own category is fundamentally different about, or fundamentally different than a, a cartridge center fire. There are certainly, um, you know, some opportunities that an optic manufacturer could utilize a different reticle technology or different turret technology that maybe mm-hmm. better matches a ballistic curve for a particular loading, um, our thought process on this is if we can know the velocity and we can know a little bit about the projectile and the zero distance, we can take an existent optical system with a, a given reticle and overlay that trajectory to that reticle. And, and you oh, don't, sure. yeah. And, and you wouldn't necessarily have to have a, a quote unquote specific design to do it. Um, so no, no, yes and no, yes. And that we have one, um, coming here for for a regulation that's out on the books and then no in that you can use any rifle scope on one so and that's like i said that is seemingly burgeoning in popularity so that's good for sure for sure yeah. i mean like you know of course surprise surprise it's one of our more expensive scopes ryan but i plan on putting a razor hd lht on my acura oh, sure. yep and uh it's going to do famously. I oh, guarantee yeah. it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Why not? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, but that's a that's a, a high end, you know, optically just, you know, stunning scope with a, an exposed locking turret, you yep. know, built for dialing yep. elevation and compensating for bullet drop at extended ranges. And it will do that with my muscle. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. And I'm, <laughs> I'm excited for it to do that, Ryan. And a, and a hefty portion of uh, Blackhorn 209. Yes, sir. Well, actually not. It's pretty modest charge. I kind of want to gas it up a little we bit. We can though. gas it up. 
I've I've run the numbers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's all fun stuff. It's all fun. It's fascinating. It, it's just an, it's an, it's incredible. Just gunpowder in general is just a very incredible thing, you know. And and I truly credit powder. I mean, with fundamentally changing and guiding the course of history. Yeah, it's been a very important uh, invention, if you will, and evolution, and uh, is certainly a part of. It's definitely kept us uh, kept us free, right, in our country. Oh yes, you're darn right. Wasn't for firearms and gunpowder, we we uh, we wouldn't be where we are today. We wouldn't we wouldn't be sitting here talking about all the recreational aspects of reloading. Correct. <laughs> that's, that's right. So I got to know: Do you have a favorite Hodgson powder? Oh wow, Ryan, that's a loaded question. Well, here's the thing. I have an op- It was a good pun. Thank you. It's I good have more pun. credit for my puns as well. I, through this podcast, I get the opportunity to meet my childhood heroes. <laughs> and so when when I think about this, it's like I know I do. I, if I was going to pick one for the rest of time, it's H forty three fifty Varget forty eight thirty one shortcut H one thousand and tight group. So that one powder <laughs> is, <laughs> yeah. is is my favorite. But uh, what what if you had to pick one for the rest of eternity? One yeah. powder. Well, you know. I think one of the best powders for what I love to do in my 270 short mag and my 300 short mag that I shoot a lot is Rotumbo. Sure. Yep. What a fun yep. name too. Rotumbo. It really is such a great powder. Sure. Sure. What a fun name. Just rolls off the tongue. It, what it means, thunder, doesn't it? Thunder, yeah. Yep. Rotumbo. Chris, I have to, uh, I, I do have to compliment you on, uh, couple of your cartridge choices there too the old uh i don't have a 300 short mag but i've always been a a fan of the 300 short mag i mean i don't have a 270 i was gonna say mark you own two 300 short i've been lying to our listeners for years (laughs) now right no i uh uh, you caught me no i don't have a 270 short mag but i've always been oh man i've been enamored with the 270 short mag that thing's like lightning man that's a fast that's a fast i should i took i took uh it took uh, my 270 short mag two times to Africa and I shot everything with it. Sure. No kidding, Great. huh? Yeah. Yeah. But yep. the, the 300 short mag, I am, uh, I am a uh, big fan of that cartridge. I've shot it since, golly, probably just a couple years after it came out. Sure. I think I started shooting that cartridge in 2004. And did it come out in 02? 01, 02. 01, 02 ish, something yeah. like that. I remember being a, a fresh out of Catholic school. And drooling over a Winchester Model 70 shadow, mm, thinking, yeah. I need that. There you go. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. You did need it. Uh, that's cool. I, I, I like that you like the, the 300 short mag. That's cool, man. That makes me feel that uh, validates me. And Rotum- as a, as a <laughs> And Rotumbo. Yeah. That's a big gun powder, Rotumbo. That does big gun things. Do we need some of that? I think I have some Rotumbo at home. Because okay. <laughs> <laughs> I also own a 300 Weatherby, so... Yeah. Well, we've got those uh, we got those Barnes LRXs we're, that we need to. I think we're going to be spicing your your 300 wisdom up with 4831 shortcut. That works good. Yep, that works good. That's yep. uh, that's one of my that's one of my go to um, happy medium to slow options. Um, Magnum Performance in moderate powder metering and and uh, case fill. So this is H1000 is good too. Yep, we've got we've got a, a hefty charge of that as well excellent that's gonna be great well i trust your judgment i'm just looking forward to doing it yeah which it's, i mean that's that we don't there's not a more perfect time than right now well we've got a reloading class next week mark I, maybe, wow. I, maybe i need to enroll in yep. school well please do come down be thursday and friday i might see you there oh well, i'll be there <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Awesome, Ryan. Did we did we miss anything here talking to talking to Chris about? I mean, there's a billion questions that I can ask because <sighs> again, I'm containing myself um, because this is all so fascinating to me. I I, I distinctly remember reading um, about about uh, the origins of of your company and and how it it came to be and and having. I haven't been to your plant. I've been to um, the federal plant in Anoka. I've been to the Hornady plant many times. Um, and you know, I'm always enamored to read about that period in our history as a country 
which I think was truly the heyday, you know, when we had mm. the best firearms, we had the, the most cutting edge of bullet technology available to the consumer. I think of like the Nosler story and, and how that came to be, you know, a, a disgruntled bull moose and uh, a really muddy shoulder and enter the Nosler partition and what it must have been like to be, uh, you know, somebody my age or, or otherwise having those technologies so new on scene and available at that point, that really was the greatest time in, in our history, I think, um, as a, as a shooting public, if you will. And what an awesome thing that, that you were a, a part of that. And from, from infancy on, you know, and yeah, I could, I could just sit around the proverbial campfire and listen to every nuance about it. You know, what a, what a cool thing, but no, that, would send us into oblivion on time. So well, you guys probably feel a lot like me, you know, it's, it's so good to talk to customers um, every day, you know, that, that share the same passions that we do, oh, yeah. you know, yeah. and, and they're so excited. Um, it's not like uh, you have to have our products, right. But, but they are so excited about being part of the outdoors and, enjoying uh, their hobby, you know, and, and just, just living it. Um, it's, it's, it's so satisfying to come into work every day um, and to talk to people who share the same values and the same uh, passions uh, and the same hobbies as, as we do. Right. Absolutely. I have not shown up for a day of work yet in nine and a half years. So, I mean, the, <laughs> yeah. that is, the, that is the truth. And yeah, some parallels there. And I mean, I would have to think Chris, like it's incredible for you guys that your products are a big part of people's most cherished valued memories. Uh, just the, the experiences that are true bright spots in their lives, the experiences that they tell stories about on the regular. Um, it's just, it's just neat that your products are a part right, of it's generational, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. It's, it started with our grandparents and then our dad and, and then now it's us. So, uh, yeah. I love it. Well, you've, you have picked up the torch and are carrying it forward and I guess just don't carry it too close to the powder. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> no smoking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Well, Chris, man, I appreciate you and I appreciate your time. And like Ryan said, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that I've left so many questions on the table. I'll, I'll probably call you later and be like, Oh, Hey, what about this? Um, but, uh, no, man, I appreciate you taking the time to join us here and talk about, uh, your company and, and your products. I mean, like we said, I mean, they, they, just, they are a part of, of so many, um, you know, amazing experiences, hobbies, passions, uh, memories, uh, and also, you know, uh, a product that's shaped our country and our history. So, yes, absolutely. Uh, just pretty cool stuff. So thanks, everybody, for listening. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed this as much as I did. Uh, once again, Chris, thanks again. And, uh, Mark and Ryan, thank you, guys. It's yeah. a pleasure to be on today. Yes, yeah, certainly. Yeah. And if anybody else has some additional questions or stuff that we should have asked, let us know in the comments below. Until then, we'll catch you on the next one. See you. Bye. There you have it, folks. Thank you very much for listening. As usual, give this video a like if you liked it. Comment something below and give us a subscribe to the Vortex Nation podcast channel. It would mean a lot to us. Also, why don't you give us a follow over on Instagram while you're at it, at Vortex Nation Podcast. We'd love to hear from you over there, and we'll keep you updated with all kinds of cool photos and videos from our adventures that we do here. Otherwise, we will see you on the next one. Thank you again. Happy hunting and shooting, everybody. Have a good one.